Hey Jason, it's me TJ coming to you live on videotape, still alive. I thought I would um, put together that video tour that you requested, virtual tour of my shop. I started outside here, as you can see. This is behind my workshop. You can see that little duck swimming across the river there. Um, and I thought I'd start outside so, so you could uh, be somewhat certain that I'm wearing pants, at least a little more, see, have pants on. You can't be sure these days because everybody's working at home. All right, so I'm gonna flip this around and show you my workshop. That's about, that's 200 feet from the river exactly, I know, because you can't build anything closer than 200 feet, so I built it on the 201 foot mark. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna pause this and then when we get closer to the shop, I'll turn it back on and then we'll go inside, okay? Hold on. Okay, it's me, I'm back. This is uh, 10 seconds later. I'm now mm, maybe 75 feet from the back of the workshop. And this video is likely to end up being more about the things I'm excited about than the things that you would be excited about. <laughs> Um, for instance, I decided to stop and show you this. Um, I had the foresight when I was building this shop about 10 years ago to bury a thousand gallon propane tank under the ground so that green cap you see is covering uh, the propane tank, which allows me to price shop. Um, so I can, if you're buying a thousand gallons, you can get it for a steal um, compared to like trying to fill one of those little tanks for your grill, for your home grill. <laughs> they charge you a fortune for that. Um, so that that takes me through the whole year i just have the company come in the summertime fill it once and i'm i'm good for the whole year for heat and um also hot water uh, so this is here we are at the back of the shop so these big panels are four inches thick they're they're foam and i put handles on them so you can put them in and out as needed and they're really just for insulation they seal off the roll-up door in there this is uh, this door on the left side has the vacuum system in it, and this door on the right side is the entrance to the shop, and it has the air compressor in it. Um, this was added on after, like, I don't know, maybe six months after I built the shop, I realized I didn't want the air compressor and vacuum system in the shop space, so I built this on, um, this addition on, and now I don't have to breathe the dust from the vacuum or listen to the noise from the air compressor. So here we are about to enter and... What's this? Oh, Corona free place. So I put this little Purell pack out here for anybody who's coming in the shop so they can just tear off the top and sanitize their hands before they come in, um, as we're about to do. I already sanitized my hands, so it's safe. Um, okay, so here is, uh, huh, <laughs> you can see I desperately needed this space. This would all, all this clutter would be in my, my workshop proper if I hadn't built this on um afterwards but you can see there's the air compressor um and hopefully it won't kick on we're out here because it's really loud um and this is the door into the main part of the shop so here we go um and i gotta tell you in advance full disclosure um i didn't change anything this is exactly how it was before i started this video and didn't move anything hold on i gotta take off these glasses these 80s glasses sorry about those i couldn't find the glasses that i bought in the 90s um there we go okay so um so here we are in the back of the shop and we'll just start here and walk around this is um i sort of think of it as the machine room area and i used to have all of this heavy equipment in that in this little space this little cubby here was designed for them as a machine room and you can see I had these pieces of equipment in there this milling machine and this is a smaller milling machine um, analog and I had to take those out of that space when I bought this digital CNC um, so it kind of messed up my my uh, plan um, and now I can't really use this space as I planned. This was supposed to be my garage where I could bring in vehicles and work on cars. I could still fit a small car in there, I suppose, but 
I had to give up that plan for this workshop. Um, but that's why this eight foot door is here. It allows me to bring in heavy equipment, large size equipment, and uh, I was supposed to be able to drive cars in here or whatever, but I'm not gonna be doing that um, too much anyway. So this big thing, we'll start with this. This uh, is eight feet long. I can drop the eight foot door on top of it and open it up and it has two big four foot fans in it. I mean, it's hard to see because I have all these guitar boxes in front of it, but, but uh, I drop the door down on it and open all the doors and windows at the other end of the shop and I'm able to clean the shop out with a leaf blower really quickly. Um, so it's a way to, to keep the whole shop clean without too much elbow grease and trouble. So over here I have a lathe, um, which I use surprisingly often. And um, this is a sharpening station for carbide, um, uh, drills and lathe tools. This little guy with the 80s glasses on it um, is called a, um, um, it's called a, uh, <laughs> I'll just show you. Um, this is what I put the aluminum parts in. It's, it's a giant tumbler, really. And it, uh, um, you throw the aluminum parts in there after machining them, and it deburs them. So it's a vibration, vibrating tumbler. That's kind of what it's called. Uh, okay, so um, toolboxes with all kinds of stuff in them. We won't, I won't bore you with the contents of those. This is the first room on the right. This is where I seal this room off and can work with hide glue in here because I can heat this room up to 90 degrees quickly by using this heater. And uh, these are my vacuum, uh, vacuum clamps for clamping tops and backs. So I build tops and backs in here. Um, quickly heat the room up to 90 or so degrees and um, I can work in here any time of the year. It's such a small space. It's, I don't know, maybe eight by 12 or something. It doesn't take me long to heat it up, but it's also the uh, meditation room and relaxation room. You can see I got these cool uh, um, uh, massage devices. This is, uh, you put these guys on your arms, your forearms, and these guys go on your legs. Then you can, this is called a chi machine, so you can put your legs in that and it's swinging them back and forth. Ancient Chinese technology um, that's supposed to cure everything, in short. Um, these are hand massagers, which is uh, I highly recommend for luthier types, any type really, any type of typer. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a sight to behold when I get all that rig on and uh, put on the relaxation tape, but highly recommend it. Um, then the next room on the right is the stuff my nightmares are made of. Um, we should probably end the tour with this, but it happens to be on the beginning of the tour. This is kind of the uh, a separately alarmed vault where, where uh, okay, I'm a little behind, <laughs> where uh, some repairs are kept that um, are are in various stages of progress. Um, so yeah, kind of a pile of stuff there. I'm a little behind, as I mentioned. Um, then we come into the main part of the workshop. This is kind of command central where bridges come off, necks come off, frets go in, that sort of thing. Um, this is Mike Ruckel's work area. He's not here today. Um, but So I use his bench all the time when he's not here. This is a C 
two from 1930, or C, yeah, C3 maybe, from 1936, um, I think, that I put a new top on and just got a um, new bridge, which is, I hide glued on last night, so I'll take those clamps off soon. Um, what's going on over here? These are old Brazilian rosewood bridge blanks. Um, because I'm working on a 1936 0018 and for some reason it has a rosewood, um, Brazilian rosewood fretboard and bridge. So I'm making a new bridge for it because the old one is kind of funky. So I was selecting some um, material for that. These are saddle top shapers in progress that my son's been working on. I'm excited about those. He's been playing with some new colors for the handles. Um, and let's see, there's the dental composite uh, tool used for filling low nut slots. This is a rack for necks that are in progress. Um, storage for um, spruce and rosewood. Guitars that are yet to be made. Oh, here's the bar fret. Some of the bar frets. Um, that I use and sell, the CDs that I don't listen to, there's the CD player that I don't use to listen to them, I could and I will sometime but I've been listening to podcasts a lot lately, um, here we have some guitars on the wall, that's a Kalamazoo, that's a 1930 triple O 28, that's a 1932 018, that's a 1928 triple O 45. That's a 1928 triple O 28 that somebody painted in the 50s. That's a little guitar I made for my son that he took to college, and I'm doing a little work on it now. Um, this is a triple O 18 from 1937 that was split completely in half, and now. Uh, you can't really see that because the sun's shining in the windows, but but now it's halfway back together. Um, Lyle, if you happen to see this, it's coming along just fine. Um, here is, uh, what is it over here? Oh, that's a OM45 that I made years ago that's in for some fret work. This is a guitar that I have, thanks to Mark Stetman. He said it was the nicest L.O. that he's ever seen. So that's good enough for me. It's remarkable, look at that thing. It looks like it just came out of the box. Um, this is a D28 from 1934. It's the third 12, no, third 14 fret D28 made. Um, Strings, fretboard journals, piles of fretboard journals, my Fishman PA system. This is the gimbal thing I was going to try to use to make this video, but I gave up, um, just decided not to try to learn something new. I just decided to just do the shaky video that you said was fine. There's my Clorox wipes, ready for anything. That's half a Gibson. Um, so I'm actually thinking about restoring. That would be kind of the ultimate restoration project, wouldn't it? That would be unbelievable to bring that back to life. Anyway, it's it's a sample um, that was used by salespeople um, to demonstrate what is inside of the the old Gibson guitars. 1937, what, I don't know what it is, AJ or something. Something really cool. Um, but actually, I should show you for your viewers, um, should you decide to share this with them. Look at this truss rod, isn't that cool? Like getting to see how the truss rod is installed in these old Gibsons. Well, anyway, I think it's cool. Maybe somebody else will too. Um, this, is, this is going out to the front of the workshop. Um, this is the OM28 cutaway, X cutaway, was a cutaway that you asked about. Um, not too much has changed on that. This is another conversion. This is another conversion. 
This is a plant from Christmas, which, oh my God, can you believe that? Look at that. How can this plant still be so healthy? Unbelievable. These things just seem to last forever if you water them. Um, here is my beautiful illustrations of birds that Dugold Sturmer made for me years ago. He's passed away now, unfortunately, but but I still cherish those. Um, this is my little bathroom. All my dream slop sinks. I sharpen tools here, wet sand guitar bodies. I mean, come on. This is so much better than the last little tiny bathroom sink I had in my last shop. Here's another massage area. Um, I put that up in the chair, just that's for your ankles and feet. And then there's a back massager in behind that. Highly recommend that. <laughs> I know I said that before. Sharpening stuff. There's my degree from Montessori training. I'm a Montessori teacher. That's right. You heard it right. Um, uh, I have all kinds of sharpening stuff here. I won't bore you too much with that. But before we go further, there's my roll and jazz chorus, which I play through my Parker guitar um, in my band, which I went past the drums. We should go back to that for a second. There's the drum set that my um, drummer bandmate uses. We have a blast. They were supposed to come tonight, but one of my bandmates, um, who's a psychiatrist, has been unfortunately exposed to this virus, and so we had to cancel. Um, Unfortunately, man, we, we all miss it when we can't do it. More sharpening stuff. Um, I put these pictures up here for my buddy Luigi Matamote. Um, but he's never come back since I put him up here. This is kind of a funny little series of... of uh, I was pretending that this is her as a baby. It's actually Cupid, but whatever. This is her as a young girl. This is her as a teenager. And then here she is, all grown up. Um, working for Max Mara, his company. <laughs> I thought it was funny, but um, if he happens to see this video, he can enjoy it from a distance. Um, this is Bending Station, um, which I bent a lot of sides on this baby because uh, when I took over the Schoenberg project, the poor Martin guys were still bending completely by hand at that time, and the attrition rate for the Brazilian rosewood sides was atrocious. Um, they broke so many Brazilian sides that I, we just couldn't do it anymore. So I, I had to start bending them myself. So I bent hundreds and hundreds of sides in that little guy. Um, bookshelf over here is the office, which uh, my daughter used to work in full time and now she's here part time. That's Alice, this is her office and we use it too for lunch and paperwork, um, ordering too much stuff on Amazon, um, uh, subscribing to Fretboard Journal, that sort of thing. Um, over here, this room is, this is the boiler room, and you can guess what else is in there. That's right, rosewood. Fret wire, humidification. This is a uh, hard wired. This was one of my dreams when I built this shop. I always wanted to have a hard wired, a hard wired humidifier. So I have that set up. So it's a, I use it mostly as a backup because it costs a lot of money to boil water full time. It turns out, about two hundred dollars a month. Just in case you're wondering exactly how much a lot is. I thought $200 a month was a lot. That's how much it costs to boil water full time. Um, so I added this this uh, backup humidifier. This is the one that I use most of the time. It holds about five gallons and and puts about, I don't know, a gallon or two a day into this space. So that's really all I need. And then if I go away, this guy um, has a, um, it has a, um, um, what's it called? Um, uh, uh, um, 
I can't think of the name of it right now. Anyway, it has a gauge attached to it so it knows when the humidity drops too low. A hydrostat? I can't think of it. Not a thermostat. Maybe a hydrostat, yeah. Um, bandsaws everywhere. They're just all over the place. This is a, a bandsaw. This is a resaw. Bandsaw resaw with three inch blade. This, um, another bandsaw that I use for uh, different blades installed on them at different times. This is a random OM28 from 1930 hanging on the side of my collect machine, um, which I use, mm, I don't know, just about every day. I had a guy come in today with three bases, so this thing got a workout, man, um, on those three bases. They needed a lot of work. Oh, here's something cool. This is one of the things I get excited about. I make my own bandsaw blades. Uh, the light coming in the window doesn't help. Um, but anyway, this is a bandsaw blade welder. Very exciting. This is also very exciting. This is um, a fire cabinet for all the finished supplies, which I'll try to show you in there. And I'll tell you, um, I don't know if I talked about this at the last summit, but, um, but it's shocking how many fumes are coming off of those cans of, of finish. Um, they used to be spread all around the shop and I didn't know that I was breathing that stuff. But now I have a positive ventilation fan on this, on this cabinet. I just decided to invest in it and I, I didn't realize, I just thought I'd get it for safety, but I didn't realize how much, um, how much the, the, it would help with inventing these fumes outside. When you put them all in one space and open it up, it just uh, makes you catch your breath. It's so strong in there, so I'm glad to have all the, the fumes vented outside now. Um, highly recommend that. This is my little spray booth. I really installed this and built it for um, for plating. I, I plate metal and uh, I had a bunch of tuners I had to plate, that sort of thing. I plate my case tags and um, and the more I learned about plating the more I realized I was going to die if I didn't come up with some way of ventilating the fumes. So I um, put this little booth in for ventilating the plating chemicals and then I realized I could spray spray a guitar in it just as easily and I thought well why don't I do that so here's some stuff that's in here now this is a double 45 and a double 42 and their respective necks and let's before we go too far let's look at uh some of these other guitars that's it double o something or other um that's kind of a uh, unusual creation i wanted something different that no one had ever seen before this is a kind of a strict copy of an om18 this is is a uh a om30 so i got a few guitars in in progress anyway oh well maybe i should show you this so this is the way that i used to this is a machine I used to do rosettes on. Um, I would use these fly cutters, which you can kind of see a bunch of them down there. So I just had them set up um, for various rosettes and I would just switch them out. And that was just way too much trouble. So I, so I ended up um, copying Bob Taylor and, and uh, Collings. And there's a broom in the way now, but, but now I use these guys. Um, so you can do everything in one cut all, all three channels and the sound hole out in one pass. Um, there we go, now you can see better. So those, I use those in the, either the analog mill or the CNC now. Um, actually, you probably can't tell what that is. Let me just pull one out and show you. <laughs> That's just a holding rack for the, for the rosette cutter, right? See, so this goes up in the, um, chuck and then it spins and cuts the uh, the rosette channels 
Uh, okay, so so uh, next up is this guy, which you've seen before, I think. This is my rosette. Or sorry, not rosette. Um, binding router rig. So the table spins. I think you've probably seen that in videos. Um, and this guy is floating. So you can cut the binding channel as the guitar is coming around to you. This guy also moves, so kind of work in tandem together. Um, this is a dream come true to have a shop big enough to have a ta table saw. Um, I never really had a big enough shop um, with enough space to bring in a table saw. So once I got the table saw, I was able to do crazy things like this. This is my um, uh, way of storing spruce. Um, this was my test, my test uh, uh, run. I was able to to dado these cuts into the. You can see I just cut them the same width as the spruce, and then um, it allows me to store them so that the air is circulating in that vertical fashion. I'll just walk over here and show you. We walked past this before, but I'll show you the. Um, um, uh, the final <laughs> that was the test and this is what I really had in mind so I have all of my spruce up here out of the way off the floor and with the air circulating okay um, now back to where we were um, let's see yeah that's you know, there's a bunch of other stuff around here, but but that's the that's the basic um, tour: planer, jointer, sander. Um, here's my little my little uh, tanning booth. A couple of guitars in there. Getting ready for the spray booth. Um, Sander, nothing too fancy, exercise machine, AKA laundry dryer. Um, oh, I could show you my little case storage racks. That's kind of cool to come up with creative ways to get those off of the floor and out of the way. Oh, here we are looking above. Guitar uh, mold. Um, here's another rack over here for cases. I went by that kind of quickly before. Um, okay, and more, oh, they're everywhere. These case racks are everywhere. Look at this. They're all over the place, hidden wherever I could put them. Um, okay, so that's that's uh, that's the basic uh, shaky shop tour. You said shaky was okay. iPhone shaky, so there you go. 